By the end of this video, I will have convinced you that a hybrid engine is cooler than twin turbos. I know, it sounds awful, but Porsche's doing Porsche things. They've got a new 911 engine and, all right, I'll come clean, it totally sucks. No, of course it doesn't suck. This is Porsche we're talking about. It's better in every single way, with a few small exceptions. We'll get to that. Now, previously, the Porsche 911 GTS used a 3.0 liter twin turbo boxer six cylinder. Now, the new GTS is using a larger 3.6 liter single turbo boxer six cylinder. Now, sometimes people on this channel say I lose them in the math. So to be very clear, one turbocharger is less than two turbochargers. Now, this new single turbo is an electric turbocharger. So surely with an electric turbo and a larger engine, we're making more power, right? Well, yeah, but only five extra horsepower, 478 versus 473 in the previous engine. We're revving to the same red line and we're making peak power at the same RPM. And they make the same amount of torque, 420 pound feet. Though with the new engine, it is a slightly wider torque curve where you are at that peak torque. So what the heck, are there really any advantages to doing this? I mean, it seems pretty minor between these two. Well, yes, there are all kinds of advantages because we also have an electric motor sandwiched between the engine and the transmission, providing even more power. So this electric motor has a peak of 64 horsepower or continuously it can run with 54 horsepower and it's good for 110 pound-feet of torque. This raises our total system output to 532 horsepower and our total system torque to 449 pound-feet of torque from a much wider 1950 to 6,000 RPM. So if we look at the previous engine. You can see not only do we have more torque, the torque curve is now higher. We also have a wider torque curve, so there's a lot more torque available, especially on that low end where you can use that electric motor for that huge bump in torque, and it also means you have a much quicker response with those electric motors and that electric turbo into getting to that torque. So massive improvements across the board for this powertrain. All right, so that's a bunch of advantages, but what's the downside? Of course, there's the added cost and complexity, but this is a Porsche 911 GTS. Costly is a given. The only major disadvantage in my view is the weight penalty, but it's surprisingly small. Despite the fact that you have a powerful electric motor added to the transmission, a nearly two kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack, an electric motor for the turbocharger, and all the inverters and wiring to go along with this entire system, the next gen GTS only weighs one 103 pounds more than the previous GTS. Only 103 pounds for an added 110 pound feet of torque. That's a really good deal. Okay, but do the performance benefits outweigh the weight penalty? Because fast in a straight line is pretty much ubiquitous with the performance car world. But what a surprise, the new GTS handles well too, as it completes the Nürburgring Nordschleife nearly nine seconds faster than its predecessor. Love it or hate it, electric motors done right mean better performance. Now on the subject of electric motors, I want to briefly shout out a product that's fully electric and has a stainless steel exterior. No, it's not the Cybertruck, but some people might say it's actually cooler. Big thanks to LifeN for sponsoring today's video. This is the Wave Electric Toothbrush. If 7,500 RPM isn't enough for you, how about up to 66,000 VPM or vibrations per minute, combined with a 60 degree pivoting head, which results in very effective cleaning. And if you thought, hey, you know what my toothbrush really needs? An app. Well, you're in luck. But real talk, this allows for a ton of customization, so you can tune the settings like the vibration intensity or how much it pivots, and save three custom modes that you can easily switch between on the toothbrush. And finally, you can get replacement heads for less than the price of a quality manual toothbrush. A three pack is just 10 bucks, and a six pack is 17, with three different style heads available. And because I never shy away from offering bold advice, here's my official take. You should brush your teeth. Brave, I know. All right, we've strayed too far. Back to car motors. So the big advantages of this new Porsche engine are response, response, and response. So first of all, we have a larger engine from three liters to 3.6 liters. So say you want to design an engine that makes 500 horsepower. 
Well, there's a lot of ways of making 500 horsepower. You could use a really small engine with a ton of boost, but unfortunately that means it's going to have a lot of lag, a lot of delay in getting that power. Or you could use a large naturally aspirated engine. That would have really fast response. So the closer you get to a larger naturally aspirated engine, well, the closer you're going to get to having that response. And so this is a larger engine and it's actually using less boost despite making more power because it has that extra displacement. So it's boost pressure is down to about 1.3 bar from about 1.4 bar in standard conditions and this means you're going to have a more responsive engine. You also have an electric turbocharger. The response benefit of this is huge. So you no longer have to wait on the exhaust pressure to build up that boost. So on the previous engine you open your throttle all the way, you put in more air and fuel in your cylinders, that creates more exhaust, that starts spooling up these turbochargers, you start to pull in more air and then you can put in more fuel and you can finally start making more power with that boost. On this engine, you don't have to wait for that. You just take a battery, you spin up that turbocharger immediately with a 20 kilowatt motor to pull in air so much quicker. Porsche says if you take both of these engines and put them at 2000 RPM with the throttle closed, then open it, the old engine is going to take over three seconds to get to full boost versus the new engine is going to get to full boost in less than a second. And on top of this, we've got that electric motor feeding power directly into the 8-speed PDK transmission. So now we have up to 110 pound-feet of additional torque right when you put your foot down, and that helps enable you to fill in that torque gap when you're waiting for that engine to produce its full torque. So you have so much better response with this powertrain overall. Now to better understand how this system works, I want to talk through four different scenarios. So here we have a simple torque versus RPM, and you can see in blue I have the engine only torque curve, and then in purple I have the total system curve including the electric motor. So number one here is maximum power. How do we make maximum power? Well we've got three sources of power production here. So First, we've got, of course, our engine, which is creating 478 horsepower at 6,500 RPM. That's where that peak power occurs. Next, we have our battery sending power to the electric motor, helping to provide extra power to that transmission. And then finally, we're actually recovering some of that exhaust gas energy with this electric turbo and sending that power from the electric turbo directly to that motor. So getting a little bit extra power from the turbo, sending that to the electric motor, and finally getting that at the wheels. All right, so let's move on to top speed speed. Now, of course, if you're going to remain at your top speed, you can't be reliant on the battery, right? The battery could deplete and then your top speed is now lower. So to achieve that top speed, you need to be able to do it without the battery. And so in this scenario, what you're doing is you've got the engine at its peak power and you're able to use that electric turbocharger and recover energy from the exhaust and send it directly to the electric motor so you can get a little bit additional power. So actually, if you look at the engine's torque curve, it kind of comes down here, but you can can push it slightly up there on the end by using that electric turbocharger and sending that power to the motor sandwiched between the engine and the transmission and giving yourself a little bit of a bump in power. So that is where you are hitting your top speed. Now you might wonder, how do you recharge that 1.9 kilowatt hour battery pack? And so that's where we get to scenarios three and four. Scenario three, we are using the exhaust to recharge the battery. So it can do this up to 11 kilowatts of power where you can take your engine and if you're operating in a point where you don't need peak torque, meaning you're at a certain RPM, a certain torque level, but you have a buffer above that, well you can make a little bit extra power and use it to spool up this turbocharger in order to spin that electric motor, use that electric motor like a brake within the exhaust and send that power directly to the battery. The other method, of course, and the more obvious one, is just using that electric motor for regen. So scenario four here, if you're braking, trying to slow down the vehicle, you use the electric motor, turn that kinetic energy into energy that you can stick inside of your battery pack. So going directly from the motor to the battery pack, recover some of that energy to recharge it. All right, moving on, there's something I found super surprising about this engine. Directly from one of Porsche's lead powertrain engineers, quote, the new GTS engine always operates at lambda equals one, in all load and use cases, even at low temperatures. I have never heard of a performance engine that never operates richer than lambda equals one. Now, here's the problem with that statement. There's a lot of things I've never heard of, so, 
Bummer. All right, so what the heck does lambda equals one even mean? All it means is that you're using the perfect amount of air and the perfect amount of fuel so that you burn up all the oxygen and burn up all the fuel. For a gasoline engine, it means you're running an air fuel ratio of about 14.7 to one by mass. So if lambda is less than one, it means you have excess fuel or you're running rich. If lambda is greater than one, it means you have excess oxygen, thus you're running lean. So why do most performance engines run rich or with lambda less than one? Well, most of the time they don't actually need to. So if you look at a plot of torque versus RPM, and here you have your torque curve, for the majority of this space, in other words, at most RPM and at most load levels, you don't have to worry about running rich. But when you start to hit that really high torque and really high RPM, that's when you start to run into really high pressures and really high temperatures. And this means your cylinder temperatures are getting really hot, thus you're more likely to have knock and have destructive things occur within your engine. So to avoid this, you inject extra fuel. This helps cool down your cylinder temperatures. It cools your exhaust and it means you're able to avoid knock and thus you can make more power and do so safely. So what that means is if you're just going to run at lambda equals one, well, it's going to bring down your torque curve a bit on the top end. So does that mean Porsche's new engine is going to make less power? Well, not exactly. We will get to that. Now, very quickly, it's just worth mentioning. There's a lot of different ways of pushing out this lambda equals one region. You don't have to do it just by using a rich air fuel mixture. That's just one of many solutions to the problem. It just so happens to be a very easy and very cheap way of solving that problem. But there's plenty of other solutions. But why in the first place are they trying to run at lambda equals one? All right, so something very interesting happens at lambda equals one for three-way catalysts or catalytic converters. So here on our left-hand side, this y-axis is our three-way catalyst efficiency. How efficient is it at getting rid of certain emissions, whether that's NOx, carbon monoxide, or hydrocarbons? And then here on the bottom, our x-axis is whether our lambda is running rich, say less than one, or running lean, say greater than one. So if we're running rich, we're able able to make more power. That's great. But we're injecting excess fuel into the engine, which means we're going to have more hydrocarbons and more carbon monoxide emissions. As you can see, the catalytic converter is not as efficient at eliminating those emissions if we start to run rich versus if we start to run lean, well, potentially we could run more efficiently, but we're gonna now have excess oxygen within our exhaust, which means we could have more NOx emissions. And as you can see, the NOx emissions are not eliminated as efficiently with this catalytic converter as we start to run lean. So the perfect meeting point of all of these emissions occurs at that perfect air fuel ratio, lambda equals one, which is why you want to try and get an engine to run there so that it has really clean emissions. Now look, I understand that some enthusiasts get upset when you start talking about emissions. And the challenge is the more nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons that a particular enthusiast breathes in, well, the less likely it is for them to understand that it's bad for them. So no worries, folks. I'm not here to try and convince anyone that clean air is a good thing. Moving on, previously I did give you a small lie. There is a single scenario where the new GTS engine does operate rich, and that's on cold starts, because in this scenario, you need the catalytic converter to heat up as quickly as possible. All right, so let's walk through the one scenario where the engine is going to be running rich on a cold start. So the car's been sitting in your garage overnight, you get up in the morning, start it up, and for maybe a minute or less, it's going to run rich in order to heat up that catalytic converter. So how does this work? Well, here we have a simplified diagram to help understand the idea. Don't take it too literally. Again, simplified to explain how this works. So we've got our four cylinder engine here. It's going to be pulling in 100% of that outside air and you have a secondary air injection system which is going to be diverting some of that air directly to the exhaust. Now secondary air injection is nothing new. There are some advantages however with using modern higher voltage systems which we'll get into. So you have 100% of that air coming in from the start, 20% of it is going to be diverted to the exhaust, 80% is going to the engine, and then we're gonna inject enough fuel as if we were getting 100% within that engine. So we're going to be running rich, which means we have excess fuel that comes out into the exhaust, but then meets up with that oxygen, which has been injected later on. So now you oxidize that fuel with that oxygen, you have that reaction occur within the exhaust, which heats it up, you create a lot of heat in the exhaust, and thus you heat up that catalytic converter very quickly. 
Now, the advantage of having an electric turbo or a high voltage secondary air pump in this scenario is that you can handle more loads. So let's say you start up your car and you immediately floor it. Well, that's a dumb thing to do if it's cold, but let's just say you did it. In this case, because you have so much power with this electric turbocharger, you can divert plenty of air to that exhaust. Same with the high voltage secondary air pump, you can divert plenty to the exhaust. Versus plenty of cars are just running 12 volt systems for their secondary air, meaning if you were to floor it, when the engine is cold, it might not be able to pump enough air into that exhaust to make all of this work out, and you still have lambda equals one, again because you have excess fuel, but then it meets up with the perfect amount of oxygen, so you still have lambda equals one ahead of that three-way catalytic converter, and as a result, you are not worried about your emissions, you're able to get that really warm and keep it at the ideal air fuel ratio. All right, the critical question here, does lambda equals one ruin the Porsche engine? In other words, do emissions ruin this engine's potential? And actually, the answer is no, and you'll probably be surprised to learn about this through the magic of electric turbochargers. So I found a study by Molly Powertrain, and they were looking at ways of increasing that envelope of where you can run it lambda equals one. And so they took an engine with baseline, and they said, okay, enable any air fuel ratio you want, allow it to run rich on that top end so it makes plenty of power. Then they said, okay, now force it to only be able to run at lambda equals one. And as you can see, it pulled in that torque versus RPM here, it pulled that in quite a bit. And so we have this huge gap where if we were able to run rich, we could fill it in. But then they found that by using an electric turbo, they were able to push that out almost entirely to that baseline of where they were running rich. And that was just using one strategy, just using that electric turbocharger. So how were they able to do this? How does an electric turbo Turbo enabled that. I don't know. I don't know. No, I actually know. The problem is that today's engines are commonly using small turbochargers. Now, why would you want to use a small turbocharger? Well, because turbo lag sucks, you want power when you ask for it, not three seconds later, and because small turbochargers mean you can improve the bottom end of the engine. So instead of waiting and to get all of that power at the top end, you want it immediately, you want it at low RPM. So you use that small turbocharger, it spools up quickly, gets you in that peak torque, and then you just hold it out as that engine revs. Well, unfortunately with that strategy, a problem occurs as you get to higher RPM. All right, so let's say we have two identical engines, except one is using a tiny turbocharger and one is using a large turbocharger. So as you start to get to higher and higher RPM, you start building the pressure up before this tiny turbocharger. It's restrictive, right? It's blocking your exhaust flow path. So you're building up the pressure, you're building up the temperatures, your exhaust is getting hotter, your engine cylinder temperatures are getting hotter, that's not good. How do you compensate for this? Well, you run rich. By dumping in more fuel, you get that vaporization of that fuel that isn't burned, and so you cool down those temperatures, and you're able to cool that exhaust, and you don't have to worry so much about your cylinder temperatures and running into knock. Well, what if you just had a larger turbocharger? Well, it's less restrictive, so you don't have as much pressure building up, so your temperatures remain lower, so your cylinder temperatures are lower, so you don't have to worry about running rich. The challenge is now you lose all that bottom end and you don't have the response because you've got this giant turbocharger. Well, what if you put an electric motor on it? Suddenly you can spool it up even at low RPM immediately and at high RPM it's way more efficient because it's sized for that RPM. It's sized for the higher end of the engine, not the bottom end of the engine. So you get emissions benefits without losing the power. So yes, an electric turbo helps Porsche achieve Lambda 1, but you might be surprised to learn how close they already were with the 3.0 liter engine. Their engineer states they were already running Lambda equals 1 in the vast majority of use cases as long as temperatures allowed for it. A small amount of enrichment was used when exhaust temperatures reached a certain point, but in the real world, it was very rare that these temperatures were seen, so it's rare for it to use a slightly rich mixture. The new engine strategy simply eliminates these small exceptions. More power, more torque, wider torque curve, massive response improvements, better emissions. Papa John's. Porsche nailed it once again. Okay, one frustrating little comment here at the end, because if you're really excited about this engine, you're like, hey, this is cool, and you're reading all the material out there, well, some outlets are incorrectly reporting about this engine. And in fact, they're saying that this is running with way more boost, and yet it's not making any extra power, and it should be 
be making so much more power, but it can't because lambda equals one. And it's simply not true. So if this engine and this engine are running in the same scenario, same environment, this is running less boost, not more, like plenty of outlets are saying. So it is running about 10% less boost in ideal conditions. Now, if you were to take this engine and say, go to a top of a really high mountain that has really thin air, lower pressure, well, yeah, it can increase the amount of boost it has in order to compensate and make that target 478 horsepower. But in the same conditions, the new engine versus the old engine, it's actually running less boost, about 10% less boost, and that's because it's a larger engine. It doesn't need to run with as much boost. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.